Hello everyone. Today on the podcast, I'm interviewing Shelly Aronov, a serial founder and mom. Her company, Inner Plant, is taking agriculture into futuristic places. She is coding sensing capabilities into plants so that they themselves can monitor fields and collect data that can be used to help identify problems like pests or fungus as soon as they start. Welcome to the Evolve.ag podcast, Shelly. I'm so excited to speak with you about it. Interplant is an incredible company. Can you introduce yourself and tell us what inspired you to start Interplant? Sure, thanks, Wendy. It's uh, really great to be here. So I am uh, originally from Israel. I moved here about 10 years ago to the Bay Area, and I've always had a passion for building companies, which is the reason I'm here. This is my third company. All of them were in kind of traditional supply chains, either a supply chain consultant, and after that it was a food brand. And what I learned from having a food brand is that it's more about the packaging and the branding and not so much about the food. And I really wanted to go back earlier to the supply chain where everything starts, which is on the field. And around the time where I sold that brand, my father-in-law came to visit us, who's a professor at Tel Aviv University, and he told us that he figured out how to communicate with plants. And that was what sparked inner plant, or at least the journey started there. So we use um, the plant genetics in order to make plants into living sensors. So the plant is the sensor. The way that this works is, okay, the plant is, let's say, under attack by stress. Mm -hmm. It changes the RNA of the plant temporarily, mm -hmm. and that changes what we call a promoter in biology. We then encode the promoter to generate a fluorescent protein, mm -hmm. which is not native to the plant. And that is the readout that we can see. So if the plant is not stressed by that specific stress, let's say it's fungus pressure, mm -hmm which is an example I like because fungi is always in the field in small amounts. Mm -hmm. But if the plant is not feeling stressed, then nothing's happening. The immune system isn't reacting. You don't, you don't see a signal. As soon as the plant is attacked by the fungus, usually after an event, humidity, winds, changes in temperature, then that signal is activated. And then you can start seeing that there's a fungal pressure and you need to go and either apply a product or go see what it is and see what, how you can treat it. Got it. Uh, but the idea is that we track different problems and then we generate a fluorescent signal. So that fluorescent signal is what is similar to chlorophyll fluorescence, but mm -hmm. is not native to the plant. And what we know is that we can see this remotely using optical equipment and not very complicated or expensive optical equipment even. If, if you're planting your seed that has the sensing capabilities in it, then the entire field is a sensor. Otherwise, uh, for tomatoes, for example, it's sentinel plants. So the plants are sensors and they're planted in specific locations just to identify about stresses very early on. Um, and we can collect this data from as far as satellite imagery, depending on the amount of plants that we have because we found a way to see these very small signals using optical equipment. Wow, that's really cool. So you're putting sensors, you're breeding sensors into plants, and these plants are then able to transmit information back to you. Yeah, exactly. Remotely. The key to me was to be able to see it from as far as possible, because uh, one of the learnings that we've had, especially when you look at really large agriculture, is you need to do something that's easy for farmers and you can't require changes or additional work. Um, so by seeing this as remote as satellite imagery, you can give them something that we treat as a scouting tool. It's a larger pixel size, but they know where to go in the field and they know where to look for the problems and then take action really early. Um, but then you can also have a drone fly in a specific area or you can have something in the field that stays there and continuously measures if you want to get more granular data and that will eventually become what we call the ground proofing. Got it. We're working currently on tomatoes and mm -hmm. we plan to be in trials with farmers at the end of the year. These will actually just be biosensor plants and you can even breed it to the same genetics if you wanted to over time when the farmer plants their seeds every every plant is a biosensor. Got it, I see. So you could have a whole field of tomatoes and then every hundred feet have one of these biosensor tomatoes planted. Yeah, so we're thinking every there's gonna be every specific amount of acres there's gonna be a cluster of biosensors oh, that are cool. there to report. Wow, yeah. that's really awesome. So I imagine you must work with a lot of farmers. What's been their reaction to the technology? Yeah, so it's uh we've talked to many, many, many farmers, probably um definitely over a hundred farmers at this point, in the hundreds. And um there it's always it's always a great reaction. So I, I do love talking to farmers and what I learned when I started out and we were trying to understand how valuable this is to them is that when you talk to them about early detection, their eyes light up. So you know that you have something of value to them and they're very open-minded and uh, innovative. So usually the reaction is, well, of course now we can talk to plants 
And if you think about it, it's not that crazy because they've been trying to communicate with plants for a very long time, right? Now plants can talk back. But this is, if you're a farmer or an, or, or an agronomist, you've been looking at plants and trying to understand what they're going through for a very long time. Um, and then the second thing they'll say is, okay, let's trial it because they're very open to trialing new technologies. They want to see things success on their own field, um, successful. And, and I, I think that makes sense because there's so many things offered and it's really hard to know until you see it with your own eyes. So uh, that's why it's so important for us to get towards the trials and have it in their field so they can decide on their, on their own that there's value there and then continue. Cool. There's been reports and, you know, at different conferences and stuff of farmers just getting too much data. Have you run into that of people being a little bit wary that, oh my gosh, I just, I'm not sure if I want something else that's collecting data on my farm because like I have all this data and I don't quite know what to do with it yet. Yeah. So first of all, definitely you see them overwhelmed with different apps and different technologies. They, they want what seems valuable to them. So I've never had anyone tell me I don't want a biosensor plant because they understand the value in biosensor plants. Um, I think what they wouldn't want is additional work. And there's just things that are non-starters for farmers. So uh, to give you an example, I was in Australia, we're visiting different farms. One of them was a 60,000 acre farm. And for perspective, the size of San Francisco is about 30,000 acres. And to run a 60,000 acre farm, uh, that person needed a team of eight. So it's incredibly efficient. And they're talking about the startups coming to them and asking, asking for six tissue samples, which means going out to the field and collecting plant samples. Or uh, they wanted to fly a drone, which would have required 18 days of straight flying just because of regulation and the battery life and all that. Um, that's a non-starter for them. But if you give them the technology that they want without in, in an affordable price without additional work, then they're very open to it. And it's not that different from us, right? We don't want... Um, a technology that requires us to do a lot of work and we don't want to pay a lot for it, but we want the value. So that's why we designed our system with that in mind. So it's never, you never get to that point where they're going to be discouraged of trying it. Right. Technology is supposed to make your life easier, not right, harder exactly. or more complicated. We're not another data analysis platform. We're going to provide the data. So they also understand that. It's more about, do you want to, do you want to use the plant, which is the best instrument in order to understand what plant needs, what they're getting out of the soil, what the environment looks like, in order to get the right data and then provide recommendations for the farmers? Or do you wanna do more analysis and run more, more algorithms that change from day to day, from location in the field, from one field apart to another field? Um, so by providing the data, that is kind of the key uh, differentiator. The other thing is providing recommendations and not data. And mm -hmm. I think the worst thing you can do for a farmer is give them bad news without any action. No one wants that again. Right. Right. So it's not, it's not like they're unique. <laughs> None of us want that. Yeah. Uh, so what we're constantly thinking is, okay, how do you use early detection and then build on top in order to provide the recommendation so that they're getting actionable um, data that they can work with and then improve their operation and not just you know the bearer of bad news. When do you think this product's gonna be on the market? We're gonna start trialing with farmers in California at the end of the year, so and then towards next season, which is um, spring 2021, and then by the following year, we want to start selling with some of the farmers here in California. Some of the other products would take longer, so it really depends on the crop, the implementation, and, and all that in order to go to market. Cool. Well, best of luck with that. Um, you had mentioned some other applications for this technology with vertical farms and cover crops. Do you want to speak to some of that? Yeah. So uh, one of the things we're really excited about is cover crops. And cover crops are what you plant in your field between the harvested seasons. So usually being the winter. What I really like about cover crops is that they're very beneficial for the soil. They essentially help preserve water in the soil and nutrients and they reduce pest pressure. Um, they also help sequester carbon at the end of the route uh, because they increase the organic matter in the soil, which then helps sequester carbon and keep it in the soil. So there's a ton of benefits, but it's not a very used practice because all those benefits are very hard to quantify and show the, the ROI, the return on investment on. So about 10% of farmers in the U.S. currently do cover crops. And what we're developing is a sensor, a soil sensor cover crop. So it would work the same as the plants. The plants are the sensor, 
But the difference is that we're focusing on things that are more interesting in the soil, so nutrients and pH levels. And then envision that you have, you planted in the beginning of the season, of the off season, you don't really have to do anything throughout the season because these plants, the cover crops don't get additional applications or anything. And by the end of the season, you collect your images remotely and you can and you can see the a really good map of your soil in order to understand how to prepare it for the following season. So the idea is how do you create, just in a very business term way, how do you create a positive ROI for farmers so that they would want to just do the cover crop without having to sacrifice anything and losing money there. And that's where the soil sensing comes to play. That's really cool. So it's like motiv- extra motivation for farmers to pay more attention to doing cover crops and helping improve their soil. Will that sensor show what nutrients are being put in the soil by the cover crops? It will show if there's a deficiency in the soil. So cool. if you want to prepare, for example, if you're lacking nitrogen or phosphorus, and then you can go prepare it for the following season before you plant your main crop. Wow, that's really cool. What do you think the future of farming is going to look like? I'm really excited about this time for farming. As you know, and I'm assuming a lot of your listeners do, that there's been a lot of technologies coming around data, precision agriculture, smart farming in the last 10 years. And I think they've done a really great job in starting the industry. So we we look at it as the data 1.0 generation. It's been a lot of applications that should work, but still lacked something. And that something is been in the plant itself. It's finding things in the right time. We, what we see as the next generations is moving from the one size fits all that we've had for a long time to plant by plant management. And amazingly enough, the equipment exists and the technologies, the software exists. What's lacking is still the data. Right? So what you need is to be able to collect that data plant by plant in the field. And that way you can go from what an acre needs to what a plant needs. And to put that in perspective, in a soybean acre, there's about 160,000 plants. When you apply any kind of product, you're thinking about averages, right? Because you have a recommendation and for some plants, if you apply nitrogen, maybe they have too much and that's going to be wasted and go into fresh water sources. Other plants will have a deficiency that's stronger than that, and that means yield potential that wasn't really utilized. But if you can move from that to looking at every plant, scanning it, and then applying the right amount of crop protection or nutrients, that's how you optimize and get to the next level. And that's going to make a huge impact both on sustainability but efficiency as well. Cool. Yeah, my big belief is that we're not going to always have to sacrifice sustainability for efficiency. That was the old equation, right? The future can have both. It doesn't have to be one or the other. But you need the right data, and then you need the right tools, and then you have the right equipment. Five years ago, right, you would look at a website for an agriculture technology, and you'd see, by 2050, we have to feed another 2 billion people, or 3 billion people, or whatever the number is. And, uh, and we need to grow more food. And that's kind of the equation, and that's what we constantly talk about. We're looking at it a little bit different because we actually grow enough food today to feed everyone. We we throw away about 50% of what we have in our supply chain. So what we need is better supply chains. And that was the problem that I was hoping to solve for initially. Um, And I think there's a lot of people trying to solve it and doing really exciting things. One of the companies that immediately comes to mind is uh, Appeal Sciences. They make a fruit coating that extends the shelf life of uh, fresh produce. There's actually a lot of other companies that have now come around that and uh, are trying to do something similar, which is really exciting. And it makes a ton of sense. So let's assume that we can extend shelf life and we can be better in our supply chains and we can feed people. The next question that especially comes up when you talk to uh, high level biologists is how do you preserve arable land and freshwater resources? Because we've been farming this way for a hundred years and we'll know what we're doing a hundred years from now. So the key thing is we need to make sure that it's not so much about growing more food in 10 years, it's how do we preserve this arable land so we can grow food for our grandchildren. And, and you can do that without creating more arable land if you have the right technologies in order to optimize on the plant by plant level. Do you think we'll see change in the food industry due to COVID-19? I think temporarily we will. Realistically, prices are going to go up as we're seeing it. And they're probably going to represent what the cost of food are more realistically than usual, especially if you take away import markets. The reason tomatoes are so cheap here is because they don't grow in California um, and growers in California can barely sell in California because they don't get paid enough. I think long term, it's just going to all sell back into the same way it was before. So I don't think it's going to be a huge disruption or uh, change much, unfortunately. 
But uh, one thing that we think about is just the same way that this happened and we could never anticipate it. We need to prepare for what will happen if something like this happens to our food, right? If there's some super bug or some natural disaster that prevents farmers from harvesting for one year, that will hurt a lot of places, probably not San Francisco. It will be, again, like the virus, it will hurt the people that are already vulnerable disproportionately. And if we don't invest in those technologies today, then we're just creating this path for this to happen 10, 20 years down the road, or maybe earlier, who knows? Yeah, that's a really good point. I mean, there are so many things that make the food supply chain vulnerable that we don't ever talk about, from superbugs to terrible it's weather. Yeah, I mean, yeah. it just <laughs> climate goes events on and on. getting worse all the time. All of the globalization diseases move around super easily. There's a lot of opportunity to disrupt this in a bad way. Mm-hmm. Has your company been affected by COVID nineteen? Yes, it's it's been an interesting time. We do biology work in the lab and we could not access the lab really for a while wow. because of shelter in place. So it's been um, in some ways bad and then in other ways I think we've benefited of just gaining focus and working better remotely as a team, uh, which was the other weird thing is not being able to just get together or we're a small team. Uh, but it helped us focus and find the projects that are most crucial for us. So I think in some ways having this happen was... Um, helpful for the future. The other thing that's really nice is to see how everyone stepped up. Um, And I think the reason that they do is because they're very passionate about. I feel very lucky to work with people in agriculture and plants. People that choose this profession are really passionate about saving the world and land um, and food. So it's when you have that kind of driver, even COVID does not really uh, become something that stops you, I guess. That's really nice to hear. Shelly, is there anything else you'd like to add about your company or the future of farming or any of the topics that we've gone through today? Yeah, one of the things that, and, and this is exactly what you're solving for, Wendy, is teaching people, educating people about our food. I think we have a misconception that we know anything about where our food comes from, how it grows. And, you know, the easiest example for me is I have two daughters. One of them is uh, three and a half years old, and I'm pretty sure she's going to be about six before she understands that strawberries don't come in a clown shell, right? Because why would she ever, right? I mean, I'll take her to a field and I'll show her, but most people don't actually do even that. So um, one of the things that makes me really sad about this is we just don't know much. We all decided that we don't want to farm, which is totally fine. I, I understand why people don't want to go back to farming and move to rural areas, but we need to then connect more with how our food grows, the people that grow it. How does it move around? And then if we have this expectation that food is always available and cheap, plentiful, how do we understand this process uh, really to the extent that we need to in order to develop empathy and, and the education that we need to move to the next generation? And I, I think we're still not there. And people want to know. To me, this is kind of what's lacking is people want to know, but there's not enough of the right education or there's not enough of the right resources, or maybe it's incredibly complex and we need to simplify it. But I've learned so much in the last five, six years and, um, and the more I know, the more I feel like there's more to know. Yeah, I think it's definitely a challenge to show people how food grows and all the steps that go into it. And, and not just grows, but like how it gets from the farm to the grocery store, you know? Because it's not just a direct line. There's so many people in between. And that's another thing I think this COVID-19 um, has really shed light on is, you know, Farmers who have dairies can't just milk the cows there and then, you know, sell the milk necessarily. Some of them are doing it and and that's been awesome to see. But usually there's a whole, you know, 10 step process along the way of getting it to the people who pasteurize it, bottle it. And so I think it's really been illuminating just to have so much news these days on how the supply chain works. But hopefully we don't have to have another disaster like this to happen before but people understand more. But also I think it's so hard because we're, we're seeing parts of it, right? Mm-hmm. We need to, I don't know, hopefully at some point we just teach this at schools. It's the whole process, like you said. Mm-hmm. For example, where does the soybean go? Not into soy sauce, right? Right. Because that's mostly wheat. Right. <laughs> it goes to feed animals. And where does most of the corn go? Actually to make sugars and starches and, and gasoline. And what do we think of when we think about food? We think about produce that grows in California. And it's a tiny percentage of what we actually eat. Um, mm-hmm. Most of it goes into processed food or feeding animals. And, and I think we, yeah, it's, we need more than just now it's becoming all this awareness around it because people care and uh, we're probably going to forget in a few months again, but even then we just see parts of the picture. Yeah. So to wrap all of this up, I'm curious about your own eating habits. 
as an expert, as, as an expert in how food is produced and as a mom, what advice do you have for someone who wants to eat healthy and sustainable food? Yeah, I love this question. Um, so unfortunately the advice is if you want to eat something and know what's in it and have it be healthy and tasty, you probably have to cook it. Um, I'm really passionate about cooking and growing up in Israel, I think it influenced a lot of what I eat. So we buy a lot of produce and we grains and raw ingredients and we cook things from scratch. And, and I think that's, that's kind of the high level thing is like, if you want to know what's in your food, you have to make it yourself. But when I was working with the food brand, it was a hummus, a fresh hummus, or at least that's what we say in the supermarkets. And I would talk to my friends about um, the fresh juices. You know, when you see something, a bottle in the supermarket, it says freshly squeezed. I would ask them, how, how long ago do you think this juice was made? And usually the reply would be three to five days. And if you think about it, it makes no sense, right? Unless it was made at the store, it's probably 40 days old because you have to make it somewhere and you have to drive it and you have to store it and then you have to drive it to the supermarket. Wow, yeah. And that's still considered fresh, at least label-wise, because right. there's no, uh, well, you can write whatever you want on the label to some extent. So um, if you want fresh juice, you should probably make it. The other thing that I, I see as an opportunity in the future is in our culture in Israel and a lot of other cultures, you eat every part of the animal, right? Um, so this is a story I love uh, in my times in the US, but there's something we eat in Israel called Moav Yerushalmi, which is made from chicken livers and hearts and pancreas. And it's really, really tasty. And I've yet to have been able to confu- uh, convince any of my American friends to taste it. So I think uh, the idea is if we're already slaughtering animals, if we just open up our minds, we can use every part of the animal and it is the most sustainable way. Or another example is fish, right? Off-brand fish. This is something I was obsessed with at some point and just reading about this, that, you know, we like salmon and tuna because we know what they are, but it's just one species. And there's probably a thousand varieties that are very similar to salmon. You can cook the same way um, and those get tossed, discarded because no one wants to buy them. So. Again, it goes back to the education. If we just open our minds, those fish is probably, they're probably better because they're fresher. They're just not something that you immediately recognize. Yeah, it's not part of the cultural food rhetoric that we have or, you know, the cultural food traditions that we have. We're used to right. salmon and But think how crazy tuna. it is. We eat salmon and tuna and tilapia and shrimp. There's thousands of varieties of fish. This is just something we chose to label. Mm-hmm. But yeah, it would, it would take um, a small movement. Well, thank you so much, Shelly. It was a pleasure to have you on the podcast. I'm really excited to see how Inner Plant moves through the future and all of the cool things that you're developing. Best of luck. I look forward to hearing about some updates in the future. Thank you, Wendy. And continue to do this. It's really important that we just... Thanks. We learn more about this food system. We're 